So, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, first I want the organizers, especially you, uh, for giving me the possibility of coming here today, because it's a real pleasure, because I never would have that there would be once the chance and the possibility to speak about shamanism and archaeology in front of researchers with a focus on this topic. Um, second, I have to apologize before really starting for two things. The first thing, my talk could be perhaps a little bit negative after all those examples. And the other thing is, uh, I have to admit, to admit that my, en my English may not be the best. So I hope it will work. I hope you don't mind. And I'm looking forward to all your questions and uh, hopefully a uh, fine discussion afterwards. So when I received the call for abstracts for this session, I didn't hesitate not one moment to write down a proposal. Because it was shamanism in prehistory, or better saying, a critical reflection about the usability of this ethnographical term in archaeological context that I was working on for three years during my PhD that was published in 2015. In this PhD, I focused on the word shaman in the meaning of Michel Perrin's distinction between a narrow and a wider term and its problematic operationalization in the archaeological context. Because the word shaman, as you all know, has a lot of meanings. But why is this so? Isn't shamanism a nowadays widely known and commonly used word not easy to explain? Just as remark, in the year 2014, uh, the word shaman had the longest entry on the German Wikipedia, just <laughs> to mention it. As we have heard already some very impressive talks about shamanism and ethnological examples from all over the world today, it really seems like there exists a wide-spanning phenomenon that has many aspects in common. But for this talk today, please allow me to use only the narrow meaning of the word in Michel Perrin's sense, and therefore I will focus on the Siberian usage of the term. And it's for a good reason, because as Arnold van Gennep already mentioned 1903 in a small paper about the problematic usage of shamanism, it's the most dangerous of the wake words that modern ethnology, meaning the scientific research at the beginning of the 20th century, has inherited. But how can this be? When I prepared my talk here, I was not quite sure if someone before me would say something about the history of research for the term shaman. So I just want to name some small steps in the most important stations, some we already have heard today. Starting with the diary of the Russian Orthodox priest Avakum, who traveled in the 17th century through the territory of the Tungus-speaking Evenki. He was the first who ever wrote down the term shaman, an indigenous term which referred to a special type of healer and religious specialist in those regions. Comparable practitioners had been described hundreds of years earlier, for example by the monk Wilhelm of Rubruck or Marco Polo at the courtyard of Genghis Khan. But those early descriptions are problematic as they show those diviners already side by side to Buddhistic monks and therefore a real and true shamanism can't be seen there anymore. Nevertheless, Avakum's words of the Siberian ritualists were spreading fast through Russia after his death because of his high impression for reforming the Russian Orthodox Church. And therefore, not even 30 years later, the term shaman was used as a common terminus technicus for all types of religious specialists, not only by Russian travelers, but also by Russia-interested researchers in, re in Europe, as, for example, the famous picture by the Dutch diplomat Nicholas Whitson shows. The picture we here have seen many times now, uh, just a remark, Robert Hammerjan several times now published that it seems like Whitson never saw this shaman for himself, but uh, that this picture was made in Amsterdam by Whitson calling another traveler who gave a description to the artist making this picture. That's just a small remark. And here are starting the problems already. Because already in the 18th century, the many different forms of shamans in Siberia were subsumed under a stereotype word, 
that was also transformed into a mocking joke by the scientists of enlightenment or Katarina the Great, she wrote a theater piece about the Siberian shaman. And the shamanism was treated as heretic stuff by European missionaries. Indigenous words, internal distinctions and rituals were ignored, described in two short terms, and sometimes European travelers invented things to create a fascinating travel report, a good selling topic in the 18th and 19th century, as Gloria Flaherty has shown in her monograph monography about this theme. Worst of all, the well-known Jessup expedition, the well-known re Jessup research expedition, finally started a new area for worldwide research projects and also transported the shaman into international waters. Well, before the expedition under Franz Boas and his team of Russian and American scientists, shamanism was a term mostly restricted to Siberian ritualists. The circumpolar investigations that created a Kulturkreis was used for all specialist, uh, specialists in the investigated area. And following this, its usage was expanded to cultures <coughs> all over the world, as word for comparison with milestones following being, for example, Mircea Eliade or later Michael Harner's extremely wide approaches. But the problem can be shown easily by asking what, after all this long history of transformations and widenings of the meaning of a word, determines a shaman? And what differs it from other types of religious or ritual specialists? And the most problematic question, is this term really usable for archaeological purposes? The ethnographical definitions, if regarded with care, don't help the archaeological research. As the German researcher Ernst Stiegelmeier in a hot discussion with the famous Siberian shamanism researcher Hans Findeisen defined it, please allow me to give the try for English translation, I will quote it, besides the basic feature the technique of ecstatic communication with ghosts, there are the following points of determination for defining shamanism. The special qualification of persons entering ecstasy, they're generally acting for the welfare of the community, and the justification of their actions on the basis of a special soul ideology. In the quote, in this quote, Stiegelmeier shows four main themes for defining shamanism that can be summarized as ecstasy, qualification and initiation, special cosmology, <coughs> and a duty for the community. Although those four terms seem at first glance to be very abstract, they can be found in many other definitions on shamanism, sometimes under a different name, sometimes widened or divided into sub-themes but they form the most basic consensus for the ethnological definition of shamanism in the research of the late 19th and during the 20th century. For every category, we could now speak <coughs> for hours, and I guess I could have made uh, one talk or one discussion or one session for every category. But in the shortness of time, please allow me to rush to the core question. That was and is, how can we identify shamanistic ecstasy, a special qualification, a specific cosmology and a duty for the community in archaeological remains or in the case of my research in prehistoric burials. For answering this question, archaeologists as Louis Williams, we already heard the name, Henri Breu, also we heard the name, or Christine van Pol were looking on the one hand for prehistoric iconography. On the other hand, we know only some highly disturbing burials that have been interpreted for a long time as the remains of religious specialists. <laughs> to name and to show just some, Bad Sub in South America, here on the left side, Hilazon Tachtit in Israel, Ust Udinsk on the right side in Siberia, and finally, some, uh, one that perhaps you know from the name or from the pictures, the well-known burial of Bad Durenberg. 
by using the last one I want to show you why it was called a shaman's burial, which categories were used for this identification and why it is really at the end a problem. Just in short, the Mesolithic burial of Bad Dürrenberg near to the city of Merseburg in eastern Germany was found during of construction works in a local park in the year 1934. The burial of two persons sadly was not investigated in a proper way. The park, closed for the works, should reopen the following day. So the recovery of the burial happened only in half a day and only in the last hours an archaeologist was present and that's the only original drawing that we have of this finding. That's the reason why we don't know much about the so-called shaman's grave. But what we know is amazing. In this uh, 1.46 meters deep pit, the remains of two people have been deposited. Radiocarbon datings allow to conclude that the deposition was made between 7018 and 6230 BC. An important point because the first investigator, Bicker, um, thought that the burial should be a Neolithic burial. So we had a re-dating of the burial. One of the persons, an adult female, had been laid down in a crouched position and it's not out of question and of debate if the female was buried in a sitting position, as we know it from similar burials of this time in Middle Europe. With her, a four to six month old child was deposited near her femur. With the two individuals, nearly 140 artifacts have been deposited in their grave, what makes this one of the richest burial of the whole time context. And not only the amount of grave goods was astonishing, Besides sweetwater shells and parts of some turtles, the burial contained more than 50 stone tools and elements of jewelry. The most impressive objects were here, as you can see on the left side, for example, a polished stone axe. I have to put it again with a polished stone axe in a Mesolithic context. So a very fine thing that must have been imported from far away. The bone of a crane with microliths inside two boar teeth, an antler mask and small soft water shells that were postulated as parts of a garment. What made the burial of Bad Dürrenberg special was the case that the items found there were fitting to the modern picture of a shaman's dress. As for example the crane bone was interpreted as a potential rattle, the turtle shells perhaps as remains of a drumming instrument the boar teeth and other elements in the grave were seen as the rest of a shaman's costume, as it is known from why parts of Siberia we already saw some examples today. And one thing made the case even more interesting. In our anthropological investigation of this finest, uh, famous found, um, Poor and Alt found a mark at the skull that was before interpreted as outcome of decapitation. Looking closer, they now conclude that it comes from a natural deformation at the back of the skull that could have resulted in a woman suffering from epilepsy during her whole lifetime. All those things, being disabled but still having reached adulthood, the rattle and the remains of a garment were therefore interpreted as material symbols for the abilities of a once powerful shaman a woman that could reach a form of ecstasy by rattling the bone, singing and drumming and after all falling into a deep alternative state of consciousness. As powerful shaman, this was also the reason why she was rich, as shamans are still seen to be some of the most powerful and therefore most respected and also economic potential individuals in their prehistoric societies. I will come back to this case later and for now just let, allow me to quickly jump to another contrary case study. It's the grave of a young woman found 2007 in central Yakutia and being one of the best excavated modern shaman graves worldwide. The separated burial was found by a French Yakutian cooperation project that was already investigating some graveyards in this region as they heard about a separated burial on an artificial small hill in the middle of the steppe. This place, known to the indigenous people as Kis Oinuga, the grave of the young woman, 
contained an astonishing complex. In short, the grave, it turned out to be the grave of a 15 to 23 year old woman who was buried in the year 1728 AD due to dendrochronological data. In her grave pit, she had been laid to rest in a coffin of birch wood and on top of this coffin, a whole young birch tree that had been rooted out completely before had been placed. And this picture, you still can see, well, I'm sorry, in this reconstruction picture, you can see here the birch tree. The upside construction is a reconstruction, but we know that this construction still was visible in the 1920s, and then it was burned down by a young uh, communist movement who wanted to destroy the heretic cult place. Uh, sorry. The young woman inside her grave had been placed in the grave on a horse blanket with a richly decorated dress. Wire earrings with black and white pearls had been given to her and two wooden vessels were containing a milky liquid. It's thought it could have been um, a milky alcoholic liquid, but it's not quite sure. But well, no, was another thing with her very well preserved grave as she had been bound with two leather ropes and the arms of her coat had also been stitched over her fingers. All those things made the interpret interpretation clear for the two excavators Alexeyev and Krubesi because the birch tree had been a holy tree in Yakutian shamanism throughout the 18th and the 19th century and had been used very often in shamanistic rituals. Also, tying deaf people is only ethnographically passed down for suicidal persons and shamans in Yakutia. But suicide in this case can be ruled out as an open tuberculosis could be found as cause of death for this woman. Well, comparing the two burials at Kiss at, and at Bad Dürrenberg and their interpretation as shaman graves, we remark a lot of differences, especially if we look back to the four categories of defining a shaman from the beginning. But Dürrenberg seems to fit better in the picture. We have a woman who is not only connected to ecstasy by her grave goods, but also by a disability that could have resulted in a predisposition for reaching the alternative states of consciousness needed for shamanistic deeds. Therefore, two of the four things would be available here. In KISS, only one category would fit. The birch tree as material remain of the world pillar and as a holy tree in the Yakutian shamanism. But nonetheless, the burial at KISS seems to be a real shaman burial, as the historical sources show it for this time. So, what are we doing now? From my research during my PhD, Looking at sources for shaman's burial in ethnographical records from Siberia, there seems to be some interesting details that were normally in the former archaeological record ignored. First of all, and most important of all, most of Siberian shamans are buried as often separated, but in most cases, deviant burials. May it be Boyatian cremations, where the ash of the shamans is filled in lonely trees in the steppe, or Yakutian platform burials, as described, for example, by Nachtigall. Shamans normally are not buried in the form reserved for the rest of their society, and normally not near to them. The reason for this is very easy. When looking closer to indigenous sources, it can be easily reconstructed that being a shaman is the worst thing really the worst thing that can happen to a human being. Not only are you feared and shunned by a whole community, a whole society and by your community members, as the ghosts of the outer world are always around you and you have always to keep care not to be the victim of a supernatural assault, but in times of danger or illness you are called whether you like it or not. Michael Obitz described his Maja shamans in Nepal as persons with a voice in the community but also as being persons with only low financial and economical power, as most of Asian shamans in older times were no full-time specialists, but they are only paid for their duty when they do it. And then the chicken for a healing is not enough in comparison 
to the three days, uh, three days you lose if someone gets sick during harvest time when you can't get to the fields. Therefore many stories and myths throughout Siberia exist about young acolytes that tried to desperately run away from their destiny to become a shaman. Many of them die because they are punished by the ghosts, but we have a lot of those sources. But moreover, being a shaman means being someone special. The tools of a shaman are as mighty as their half-supernatural owner that already can switch between worlds during his lifetime. Giving the, the ensouled drum of a shaman to a deceased shaman would be in the mind of a Siberian community member as if you would give a loaded gun to a murderer. As no one knows if you have treated the shaman right during his lifetime. <coughs> for this, Kiss shows typical signs for treating a dead shaman, burying him far away from the, from the society and with a mixture of respect and fear, so that he has no reason and no possibility to come back as aggressive evil spirit. Taking this into account, you perhaps remark a problem for archaeological interpretations of shaman burials. Because if you really use the term shaman defined as this supernatural being that helps his community by leading ghosts, would never be burying with their tools of ghost dominance. <coughs> Meaning a so-called shaman's tool in a grave would be a, sign, uh, would be a sign for the burial person not to be a shaman. And moreover, if you take the disability into account that we were speaking of in Bad Dürrenberg, an interesting source from the Russian ethnographer Sergei Shirogogorov comes in helpful. He once stated at the beginning of the 20th century that a becoming shaman should have enough power to fall into ecstasy at will. But a person always falling into ecstasy would be treated as disabled and therefore treated by the shaman in office. The so-called female shaman from Bad Dürrenberg is therefore a problem, because her objects, her disability and the fact that she was buried as a rich person with a child are enough signs for not calling her a shaman. For this I suggest to call her at most a religious specialist or religious expert, we already had this, or ritual expert. Because it seems that if even we would follow Christine van Poel with a multifatic approach to shamanism, using terms like priest-like or shaman-like on a more multifatic, stereotypical way, we had to rule out the interpretation of Bad Dürrenberg in this case. Because shamanism is one of the most vague words that we have inherit inherited from the ethnological research, and if not used in a well-defined manner, it leads to dangerous misinterpretations of the whole past. Thank you for your attention.